Welcome everybody. You're going to stay curious today with a jam-packed July 28th to space history spanning decades, including manned and unmanned missions to the moon and America's first space station as the second crew heads to it 50 years ago today. I'm Mark Marquette and I'm proud to bring you these stories as we celebrate the birth of the American Space Age in its delivery room, the American Space Museum in downtown Titusville. Here I am on the moon again, where I love to be, a lunatic, with my buddy Marty Winkle. And Marty, hello. We've reached Friday today, January tw July 28th, our 860th episode. And you had a little bit to do with this picture as your lunar module number 10, built by the Grumman in uh, workers, uh, landed on the moon safely 52 years, 50. Yeah, two years ago we'll be celebrating uh, this weekend on July 30th. So, hello, Marty. How are you? I'm good, Mark. How are you doing? Well, good. You see pictures like this. Do they stir anything in you as, as far as like, gee, uh, I saw them load that vehicle with them wheels there on the pad? Yeah, except I didn't see that because it's loaded before it gets to the pad. And I worked uh, almost entirely at the VA being a pad. But it does bring back memories. A long, long time ago. That is actually the rover there that had done, uh, and this was one of the, the pit stops it made there. You can see the activity of the astronauts' boot prints around it, uh, churning up the lunar regolith. That's what they call the soil. Uh, this is a spectacular landing. We're going to detail the place where... Uh, Apollo 15 landed, what the vehicles were called, all that kind of stuff today. Uh, and like I said, a jam-packed Stay Curious program with a birthday or two to share with you, okay? But, uh, of course, we are a proud 501c3 nonprofit here in the state of Florida for about 25 years. And we want to show you a way that Marty and I can take your money, all right? And uh, maybe you want to give just $5 a week to... Stay curious for the enjoyment that we bring you. That's a buck a day, okay? Well, you go up to the, uh, uh, as you're watching the program on YouTube, this is a YouTube donation, or you bring up any program, you can, on the, the, the bar below it, you click the little three dots I'm pointing at right there, and that brings up this window, and then you hit the thanks button, and when you hit the thanks button, your name comes up there, on uh, your account and it automatically has two dollars that I want to donate and I hit buy and send I've given two dollars but this bar across the bottom there you can click and give more in fact of increments of about twenty dollars uh, ten dollars and then you can do go a hundred dollars all the way up to five hundred dollars you see that bar there on the bottom and contribute in the American Space Museum believe you me well thank you this is a super thanks uh, which directly supports the American Space Museum, every penny of it, thanks to YouTube, how we have monetized YouTube. Uh, uh, we're proud of that. Bruce Jacobs, our IT director, has spent literally years trying to get to this point with us. So that's how you do it. To go, to go back, uh, it's uh, right there at the three buttons. We're kind of used to those three buttons. Look for them. That brings up this, this uh, menu with the thanks where you can download the uh, the shows. Then they have a bar at the bottom that starts at two bucks, goes all the way up to 500. There's a hundred dollar donation from myself. So, all right, thank you. And, we're, and we do appreciate it. Uh, we don't like to beg for money, but it's a fact as a nonprofit that we support, are supported by uh, grants, uh, in-kind donations, and uh, just any way we can bring some money into our little old space museum here. So, uh, and, and many of you have responded. God bless you and thank you. We have, we have probably uh, gotten over ten thousand dollars in the three and a half years that Marty and I have been doing this program. Several in some big chunks there, but we appreciate all the hundred dollar donations uh, from people like uh, Dave Stangy, the UCAC brothers. Uh, and, and on and on. We just uh, appreciative uh, to all of you uh, that give us stars on Facebook. That's another way you can tr contribute. Uh, okay, uh, stars are uh, a way. I'm not sure how they figure it, but um, 
We've got Cliff Watson is giving us 200 stars from Australia, and he says that costs him about 10 bucks. So thank you all for supporting Space Museum. But let's get into our wonderful program today to stay curious. This, who is this guy? Well, you're going to know Abe Silverstein here in just a minute. This is a guy that, uh, one of the uh, hidden figures, if you will, of the Apollo program. Uh, back in January 1960, old Abe was at a, uh, a luncheon in Washington, D.C. Uh, with all of the leaders of the Apollo program, or what he called Apollo program back then, with the uh, NASA leaders that had just transitioned from the National Advisory Council on Aeronautics, NACA, to NASA in 1959, and Keith Glennon was NASA's first administrator. Well, back in January 1960, this guy, Abe Silverstein, mentioned to Bob Gilruth and Glennon, Max Faget was there, the, the designer of our spacecraft, that he thought the name Apollo for the manned spaceflight program uh, that was to follow Mercury and Gemini. And uh, they, everybody bought it. And so on this date, January, July 28th, 1960, NASA Administrator Keith Glennon announced that the spaceships to the moon would be under a program named Apollo after the Roman god of the sun. So there you have it. Silverstein had an illustrious career uh, in the longtime NACA manager, National Advisory Council on Aeronautics, that is, founded just a few years after the Wright brothers, actually and then changed to National Aeronautics and Space Administration in 1959. So uh, one of the unsung heroes there, and we love sh uh, sharing uh, people like uh, Dr. Abram, Abe Silverstein, who is inducted into the Glenn Research Hall of Fame up there in Ohio. All right. Well, we got some birthdays, Marty. We got, we got an astronaut birthday today, all right, and uh, then a very special birthday. The uh, astronaut birthday is Scott Parazinski, born July 28th, 1961 in Little Rock, Arkansas. But stay tuned, he doesn't consider that to be his real hometown, though he had 58 days in space, seven EVAs, four of them a record on the same mission. But we've also got another birthday, Marty, as it's the boss's birthday, Karen Conklin. And Karen sometimes has a little bit of balance issues. So Marty and everybody chipped in there and got her a bubble wrap suit that she's wearing there. God bless you with a pink flamingo and a, a, a batch of special uh, uh, band-aids there for you, Karen. Well, we love you. Her birthday's this weekend. Not sure uh, if she's in her 30s or 40s yet. She's so young looking there. But uh, hope that this protects you going down the halls and... Uh, you don't get any bruises uh, here at work. So thank you. We love you, Karen Conklin. She's been involved, Marty, 20 years this month with the American Space Museum, a few years before that as a volunteer, and has been our executive director for almost five years. So happy birthday, Karen Conklin, our leader. And we want to keep her safe in her beautifully tailored bubble wrap suit there. So... Well, it is Scott Parazinski's birthday, all right, and uh, Scott, uh, let's get to the, the, the data about this guy. Quite an interesting career. Happy 62nd birthday. <clears throat> Five space shuttle missions, 58 days in space. Uh, born in Little Rock, but he grew up in Palo Alto, California, in Evergreen, Colorado. All right, so moved around a little bit. Uh, we told you seven spacewalks. Um, he is the only person to uh, have gone to space and then climbed to the summit of Mount Everest, the highest point on Earth, all right? Uh, so that's quite an amazing achievement. Uh, he did an amazing, he wrote a book about some of his experiences here, The Sky Below, all right, beautiful book. One of the, uh, and uh, he talks in there about his they considered one of the most dangerous spacewalks ever done at the space station, where he uh, repaired on STS-120 while he was up there in November uh, 3rd, actually, of 2007. Did a spacewalk to repair a uh, damaged solar array uh, panel while it was still uh, electrified. So, and everything went well. Uh, 
with that live solar array repair. When he retired out as an astronaut, he got into competitive luge bobsledding in 1988 and became an Olympic team coach for the Philippines during the 1988 Winter Olympic Games in Calgary, Canada. Don't think about snow when I'm in the Philippines, do you, Marty? But uh, anyway, he's a very, very cool guy. We'd love to see him here at the Space uh, Coast uh, and uh, wrangled in as one of the astronauts to talk out there by Nick Thomas. Uh, maybe one day, but uh, happy 62nd birthday to Kot Berzinski, one of America's finest out there. And like all the over 300 American astronauts in our communities, they're always out there doing great things to not just promote themselves, but inspire the next generation as they tell their one-of-a-kind stories. Only 602 human beings have orbited Earth. Scott Perzinski is one of them. Well, this is a date in history that Congress it was watching very closely in 1964 because this is the launch of the Ranger 7 a kamikaze spacecraft designed to crash into the moon with an array of six cameras going constantly, video cameras, that were going to uh, tell us what the surface of the moon looked like. Uh, were there craters that were smaller than ones we could see, you know, through telescopes on Earth? And there were a bunch smaller, for doggone sure. Why was Congress watching this launch of this Atlas rocket and Pad Launch Complex 12 at Cape Canaveral? on this date, 1964, because there had been six failures. Ranger 1 through 6 had completely failed, costing millions of dollars, and this was not going over well, because this was a key part of the reconnaissance of the moon to find a place to land safely and beat the Russians to the moon. So this was a paramount thing, and, and the uh, NASA... Uh, Big shots were under some pressure here that this uh, uh, worked out good, and it did. The Ranger 7 is shown here. It was a platform that had some uh, solar panels on it for energy, just to boost a little bit on the three-day uh, trip there, some of the batteries it had on it. And then it had an array of cameras on it we're going to see there. Okay, one of the first spacecraft to use solar panels, all right, to supply energy. Uh, and there you had the camera aperture up there at the, at the top. And it was actually going, and then an antenna was going to be beaming back live uh, the telemetry of images coming from this suite of six cameras. There were, of course, wide angle cameras, uh, telephoto cameras, and they were arranged to provide uh, two, uh, each uh, a separate channel on there. Uh, and. For a bit of good luck, Ranger 7 began the peanut tradition in NASA command stations that was carried on to the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, on the success of Ranger 7's uh, launch and then three days later impact on the moon, someone in the control room was noticed eating peanuts. Uh, and then since 1964, control rooms ceremonially, ceremoniously open a container of peanuts for luck and tradition. And that reminds me, Marty, of the shuttle era uh, where uh, they used uh, beans. Uh, Norm Carlson, the test conductor, brought in uh, some a big vat of Navy beans that were cooked up and uh, on STS-1 and got it up uh, as a good luck charm. And then beans were stinking up the place for years until, <laughs> until we were told enough is enough. We're, we're going we're to start making them here. Uh, so that is a big tradition. You'll see a jet propulsion lab. Uh, they did it during the uh, the uh, Curiosity rover landings uh, on Mars, so to speak, so forth. So big success. Uh, Congress got off their back. There's the impact crater, as seen from the lunar orbiter uh, years later. Uh, 4,000 photos were swiftly beamed back in 17 minutes as Ranger headed for destruction. Uh, between the Sea of Clouds and the Sea of Storms. And they renamed that the Sea, the Known Sea, Mare Cognitum. All right. It was followed uh, by uh, Ranger 8 in February of 65, landing near the Apollo 11 landing site of Mare Tranquility. And Ranger 9 was sent to a prominent crater called Alphonsus. Uh, so they had the, the last three were very successful, including 
Ranger 8 that did show us what the area where Apollo 11 landed in Mare Tranquility looked like. So there was one of the last photos before impact showing you an area of the moon about the size of a, uh, 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 maybe your room, okay, your living room. So craters down to just feet across everywhere you looked. Well, enough for 1964 uh, as we were uh, doing this at the same time we were getting ready to do the Gemini program. But uh, on this date in history in 1971, this would be the configuration of the lunar module on the right with the landing legs and the command module, the gumdrop looking uh, cone with the service module that had the avionics and fuel for the engine on the back there to slow them down or get them out of lunar orbit. The astronauts were, of course, to the left, Jim uh, Irwin. Uh, and let me get my Jim Irwin stuff here, my Apollo stuff here. Um, yeah, we're going to briefly talk about them uh, right now. The lunar rover was the destination. Uh, the commander, Dave Scott, is sitting there. Uh, we lost uh, Jim Irwin uh, in... Um, uh, let's see, Jim Irwin died in 19... He was the first of the Apollo moonwalkers to die. And I'm going to get to that. There we are. Right, right there. Uh, left to right, Jim Irwin, uh, he died in 1991, uh, 32 years ago, at age 61 of a heart attack. Scott there in the middle is 90 years old. Warden died in March 2020 uh, at age 88 after a stroke. And... Uh, uh, so we only have four moonwalkers alive. Scott's one of them there in the middle. Buzz Aldrin of Apollo 11 is 93 years old. Charlie Duke of Apollo 16 is uh, going to be 88. And uh, Jack Schmidt um, of Apollo 17, I think, just turned 88. So uh, the, the youngest moonwalker, Charlie Duke, at 88 years old. How about that? To open your eyes a little bit about how time is slipping away. What Al Warden has, and he was really a love guy. Everybody called him Uncle Al, very frank person and uh, talking in the public. That is a sub-satellite, they called it, that he released to orbit the moon. And then he spent three days doing some serious, serious photography of the lunar surface that helped scout out Apollo 16 and 17 landing sites. We're gonna talk more about that, as well as feature the artwork of Doug Forrest, uh, some Apollo 15 artwork, and talk about this person who we dearly miss, Bob Pearson, passed away a couple years ago during the COVID pandemic. He is showing you the Hadley Rill where the Apollo 15 landed. This is a, a plastic model, 3D model that Bob was given, similar to the ones that he used to train the astronauts uh, to land on the moon. Uh, Bob was a computer technician and lunar module simulation trainer uh, out, out at the uh, flight crew training building there at Kennedy Space Center. And uh, we had a lot of stories uh, we got out of him before co before the we created this. Uh, he never got to be on when because uh, he got sick during COVID when we started this show. And we'll talk more about Bob Pearson, uh, but a great friend of all of us here at the American Space Museum, and particularly Hazel Banks. And I know Hayes is probably watching and uh, probably with a lump in her throat there because that's a great picture of Bob. And, but we're going to revisit uh, some of the things he said in his role and contribution to uh, landing on the moon. Bob would say, I landed on the moon more than anybody. And he probably he did because he taught all the astronauts how to work the Desky computer built by MIT uh, eggheads. And he knew it very well, and he's proud of correcting, of helping uh, the smartest astronaut of all, Buzz Aldrin, figure it out. So we'll be back to Bob Pearson here in a minute. Uh, but uh, well, we got uh, Bob Smeet to talk about first there, our, our mannequin that we call Bob Smeet. Uh, the Smeet test is very important with uh, uh, Bob Crippen. Uh, we got uh, Thornton and Bob Co. there. We talked about them yesterday. They did a 56-day simulation under atmospheric conditions in Houston uh, called the 
uh, Skylab Medical uh, Experiment Altitude Test, SMEET. And therefore, uh, our, we have this beautiful mannequin, and we call him Bob Smeet. There, so, but this is the precursor of living on the space station. And on this date in 1973, uh, 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 50 years ago, officially NASA Skylab 3, all right, the space station is Skylab 1, uh, a moonwalker led two rookies into space for a 59-day successful mission of America's first space station, the second crew to occupy that. And here is here they are left to right. Owen Garriott uh, uh, and uh, Alan Bean is there. Uh, and Jack Lausma is in the middle. Uh, Jack Lausma is uh, 87 years old. And we're very familiar with Jack as he comes to Space Coast very often. And has participated in Marty's um, Grumman events as he was Capcom for the, and said the words Houston, uh, heard, we've heard him, we've had a problem message from Apollo 13. Uh, he was going to be the lunar module pilot for Apollo 20, which was canceled. But in the middle there, Jack uh, Lausman made it to space again as commander of STS-3 uh, that landed out at White Sands. Uh, but uh, Owen Garriott, there's on the left. Okay, and uh, I've seen when Owen died in... Uh, uh, 2019 at age 88. His son Richard was a space tourist in 2008 on the space station. Paid for his own way up there. So uh, went on Skylab and then 11 years later was on the, the first Space Lab mission. And of course Al Bean became an artist uh, after his career. He was a moonwalker and then commander of this. And uh, uh, qu quite a guy. Uh, never got to meet him but he was quite a warm person i'm looking to see when he passed away uh don't have it written down there but there is the launch that tom usiak took 50 years ago uh as a young lad uh, tom mentioned that he was also at the skylab launch the sky uh, uh and they had bad weather for that the orbital workshop launch skylab one this technically skylab three in the engineer's mind and then the last crewed mission is skylab four uh, and if you remember, Al Bean launched on Apollo 12 into a storm and was hit by lightning, the Saturn V rocket. So Tommy likes pointing out that Al Bean had two missions that were launched in bad weather. And man, that's horrible. He came to see the, the rocket has already gone uh, barely clear, not even cleared the tower. And uh, you can't see the whole thing in this Tom Usiak photograph there. Well, they went up. There's the Skylab. Just to let some of you know what we're talking about, the big windmill is the power supply for the Apollo uh, Solar Telescope mount, a really one of the main things they did up there. There was the second cover put over it that Jack Lausma helped deploy on this mission. And uh, there's an interesting shot of the command module that I put in there for one reason, Marty. What do you notice that's different about the command module? Well, it's all white, if you were good. Now, do you know why it's all white, Marty? I think it had to do with the uh, temperature. Exactly. <laughs> when it was a going, they normally use this command module, of course, to go to the moon. And they would put it in a rotisserie uh, type of configuration to slowly rotate it so not one side would constantly get heated. Well, they couldn't do that with this on the... Skylab, so they painted them somehow. I don't know what the, what the coating is that is white on it. And uh, to me, that's another aspect of Skylab that's not talked about, was the command modules were, were basically designed to the moon and back to be a 14-day vessel, all right, on the longest trips. But uh, we immediately went to 28 days in space, then 59, and then 84 with no problems with this wonderful command module and service module built by Rockwell and wish we just kept that in the queue uh, for a safety uh, net uh, like the Russians have kept their Soyuz spacecraft and changed and upgraded it over four decades. So now you know. Well, there's our International Space Station that wouldn't be what it was had it not been pioneered by Skylab and then, of course, the great cooperation with the Russians 
uh, that uh, become the we become the moon experts. They become the Skylab experts or the space station experts. The uh, Russians did. Well, we're going to talk about this crew here uh, a, a little bit more. The Apollo 15 crew. Um, again, left to right, David Scott, the commander, Al Warden, the uh, command module pilot, and then Jim Irwin, the lunar module pilot. And uh, the uh, part of this uh, that is interesting is the name of the spaceships. Apollo 15's command and service module is named Endeavor. It was command module 112. After the HMS Endeavor that Captain Cook took on a voyage. Uh, scientific, there's a purely scientific sea voyage, all right? And Apollo 15 was the first lunar landing mission in which there was a heavy emphasis on science. In fact, they took a piece of, the, of wood from Cook's ship, uh, Endeavor, spelled always O-U-R, all right? And then we, the British way, and of course we had the Endeavor uh, OV-105 tail number, the final shuttle that was built, uh, Orbiter, and that is O-U-R, and we'll, we'll have a tie into that here in a minute. By the way, the Endeavor spaceship is on display at the National Museum uh, at the uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, right next to the aliens that they keep over there, Marty. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> We wanted to uh, show you, oh, the uh, Apollo 15 astronauts wore redesigned spacesuits. More importantly, they had they were able to bend over completely to sit in the rover. They had upgraded uh, backpacks that allowed for longer um, uh, uh, duration on the moon. Now, Warden wore an Apollo 14 type suit, but had some modified interfaces in case uh, he had to buddy with somebody. Uh, and the moon landing was July 30th, 6, 16 p.m. Eastern Stan Eastern Daylight Time. And they took a four-wheeled cruiser to the moon, uh, uh, weighed 406 pounds, all right, and uh, it was folded up into the cargo, uh, d the uh, descent stage of the lunar module. And um, Scott used a feather and hammer to demonstrate Galileo's theory that all objects fall at the same rate in not given the, um, any atmosphere. And I think that's quite dramatic. A hammer and a falcon feather he had because the lunar module is named Falcon. And they hit the lunar surface at the same time because there is no resistance from uh, any atmosphere. Well... You can go out tonight, and I know you will tonight, and get some moonshine because the moon's going to be shining bright. Get as much moonshine as you want. It's the kind of moonshine you can't get too much of. And as you see on this this uh, uh, drawing and photos here, the landing site is in a very easy place to find with binoculars. Look basically in the center of the moon, and you see a big circle up there that is an impact crater. Uh, asteroid impacted the moon and, and though it created a, a big lava sea. Now blue marks the spot where the landing is in the Apennine Mountains over the Hadley Rill. And I'm definitely gonna you're very, definitely gonna understand that. Now here's a photo I took through a telescope showing you the Apollo 15, excuse me, is marked there, uh, uh, just over that mountain range. To the left is Archimedes, the biggest crater there. Marty remarked, why is it so smooth? Well, that's because lava actually filled up. As you see the curved rim of those mountains, those aren't true mountains. They weren't caused by tectonic plates hitting each other like earth mountains. They were caused by the splash of an asteroid that impacted. And we're just seeing half of the circle of that impact three billion years ago in the four billion year history of the Earth's um, uh, life. Up at the very top, you see cutting through the mountain is a channel. That's called the Alpine Valley. Very easy to see in a telescope. This is a low power, 100 power telescope view. You don't see craters uh, in the smooth areas because the resolution of the optics is not that good. The closer you get though, the, uh, and that's what the Ranger 7 proved was even down to just 
feet across, there's there when you're just a few feet above the surface, there's still small craters everywhere. Well, there again is in detail, a little bit more looking at Hadley Rill, quite a spectacular landing where uh, Irwin had to pop over a uh, a mountain. Uh, uh, the first human-driven vehicle in an alien world, the only stand-up spacewalk outside a docking hatch, and the first trans-Earth deep spacewalk happened uh, when Al Warden performed that. Not to mention the moon, the moonwalkers. Here is the launch uh, by Tom Usiak. All right, two great launch pictures by Tom, uh, just barely in his 20s at the time. Um, here's the landing site. A nice drawing of it right there in the center circle you see the word site all right and these are the three EVAs that they took all right they went as far as seven miles away from the uh, the, the lunar rover I mean the lander but they popped over that mountain um, which was I'm trying to see how many how many miles high three mile high Mount Hadley to land within a football field of a meandering collapsed lava tube that looks like a riverbed. I think it's the most spectacular landing site of all of them. There you see again a lunar orbiter actual photograph of reconnaissance uh, of this by our orbiter and where they landed and where they were going to go. They actually looked right into this uh, uh, lunar collapsed uh, lava tube. And notice that the mountains are very smooth They because they've been beat down by micrometeorite impacts which is nothing more than dust for millions and millions of years. Uh, they parked the, the lunar river, rover uh, far enough away to show the liftoff of the moon uh, on August 2nd, 1971. Uh, Irwin left a Bible at the control panels. And oh yeah, there was a smuggled seagull postal covers from a German dealer that halted the astronauts' careers in their tracks. They thought they were doing a good thing for their kids' education. Uh, they were paid so little, really, uh, that um, uh, it was a uh, bad judgment that they took some uh, stamp postal covers, stamped them in the lunar module, and then a German dealer was going to sell them when NASA caught wind of that. They didn't like that. So uh, the first color television sent back from a rover. Check that out on YouTube. And uh, just, just an amazing, amazing mission. When Scott landed, there was so much dust, he had a hard time seeing that last 20 feet down and uh, landed uh, almost in this crater that's right behind. And, and, and you see the tilt involved there was a little bit uh, on that. But uh, nothing was uh, that they couldn't overcome. Um, and oh, where we go there? Yeah. There. Uh, Irwin popped up and did the first stand-up EVA out of the docking hatch, okay? Uh, he sort of did this despite uh, the wishes of um, uh, Deke Slayton and NASA at Johnson Space Center. They didn't want to lose all that valuable oxygen out of there just for a stand-up EVA. But uh, he was trained... Uh, uh, by uh, Kent, by uh, Silvers, it was the geologist that trained them all, trained to get up to the high area so you could look out. So from this vantage point, all right, he was looking around and he saw uh, the the path that he wanted to take the lunar module down, and and I thought that was very fortuitous. And here is Doug Forrest. You're going to see more of Doug's work here in a minute. Doug Forrest's fabulous pencil. Uh, drawings that he spends hours and hours on. This is that stand-up EVA in Doug's perspective. Somebody looking, a bird flying over that didn't need air in the lunar atmosphere. Uh, very interesting image, and I know Doug talks to astronauts about these when he can find them, and, and, and it's part of his work to what was this like and so forth. You see the uh, behind him are some of the antennas that were used to communicate with Earth and the the uh, er, um, warden that was circling around, um, Scott asked Irwin if he wanted to get up and look out around for a minute, but they would have had to uh, change out uh, one of the uh, air hoses for him to do that. 
and uh, they decided uh, Irwin decided it was too much trouble uh, that he didn't want to do that. They did bring back one of the oldest rocks ever called the Genesis Rock, and they left behind the fallen astronaut memorial. <clears throat> there is a panorama of uh, that was taken by Scott, uh, kind of crudely, not even um, uh, photoshopped together there. One of the early ways that they just they just set stuff down there. Um, here are Irwin and Scott training out in a desert. Thought I'd just show you this picture that uh, they had a lot hours and hours of first getting used to just picking things up with their hands and and like this and then wearing full gear. Uh, and here's a picture just so, to show you technicians and people like Marty that worked this program over 50 years ago. Uh, Polaroid that. Uh, I found with some technicians saying the uh, Apollo 15 ALSEP Apollo Lunar Science Experiment Package uh, out on the pad, uh, maybe loading it up in the uh, the slaw where the uh, Marty says they would have loaded this definitely in the uh, orbital and checkout building, and then put it out to the pad. But just to give you an idea of you know uh, what am I going to wear to work today. And then when you're thinking, Marty, you're probably thinking, uh, well, let me ask you this, Mar Marty, I've never asked you this. We know that you all work lots of overtime, hours and hours. Did you bring an extra change of clothes and keep it in your locker to freshen up? Never. Never? Never. No. Oh, wow. Did anybody? Because <laughs> you had a lot of 18-hour days and then catnapped, no. I know. Okay. Never. All right. Did they have a, a right guard and such at the commissary there for uh, an extra on, on sale? <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, uh, so uh, here's here's the beautiful background that I'm using, showing you the lunar tracks across uh, the, the lunar surface. It worked very flawlessly. We took a lunar rover to Apollo 16 and 17. Uh, this one went over two, 20 miles. Uh, like I said, here's a place where you can see where they stopped and unloaded some equipment, took some pictures. And this is just an amazing picture because hidden in there, Marty, maybe you can point that out to everybody. I think you probably should. Is the lunar module almost five miles away? And oh my gosh, there's my home. There's our right home, Marty. I hope it works, brother. You better have that guillotine. Uh, uh, comb just right all those wires connected to get that thing home but uh, what a what a moment for some of these astronauts to look back and think wow it'd take me like a half hour to walk back there or, or longer and they would not go further than the than the oxygen and and uh, consumables in their uh, backpack would allow them to walk back safely so if the lunar rover broke down but it never did and to my understanding if you put new batteries in it you could probably drive it away today after 50 years on the moon uh, so a lot of people say we wouldn't see why not and uh, so maybe they'll do that someday well we want to hello our good buddy Doug Forrest out there in Los Angeles area uh, Doug Forrest uh, is uh has made a side career out of worshiping the apollo era we love that he is a compositor a uh, visual effects compositor out there in los angeles for television what a compositor does is create the final image of a frame a shot or a video effect sequence where they take all the digital material the cg computer generated images live footage paintings uh, and combine them as one cohesive image and shot. So, uh, Doug, hope that uh, describes what you do out there. But uh, he's become a good friend of our museum, thanks to another artist, Chris Cowley, that they've became known each other out at the Space Fest event that for years was a big uh, event in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, by the Poor family uh, that really fueled the Apollo era. And uh, Doug uh, has uh, his website there, and there's a, a couple of his images that you see. We featured his Apollo 1 as our background a few times. But Doug was born in Glasgow, Scotland, and uh, you'll know that he has an accent when you meet him. And um, hope he's not blushing here. Let me make sure I get my, my P's and Q's together here as we're getting ready to show some of his artwork. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Uh, he began collecting books on Apollo 11 in the mid-1990s. Uh, grew up in Glasgow, Scotland. Always was involved in uh, artwork or models. Uh, moved to London and got in the visual effects camera business in the movie industry. Uh, he ended up in L.A. in 1996. And, uh, and uh, uh, Yoshiko, his partner, and their son, Mark, uh, I met uh, his uh, beautiful uh, wife, partner, Yoshiko, there. But uh, he says, I'm an artist. I'm interested in the human side of early missions, also the geometry of the machines and equipment. I like the engineering of the launch towers, the spacesuits, and the rocket engines. I've always been fascinated by the complexity of them and think that they can be looked at as pieces of art in themselves. And you're going to see him do that here in a minute. He's a member of the International Association of Astronomical Artists in the British Interplanetary Society. And he was once involved with Save the Lut, Marty, about preserving the launch umbilical tower from the last Saturn V launch. And uh, though... Uh, uh, they 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 came they acquired some funds but they didn't get enough for environmental reasons. The Lut Tower came down in 2004. So, <laughs> um, let's look at uh, some of the artwork specifically that I talked with uh, <laughs> this wonderful artist Doug Forrest about. He talked with uh, Jim. Uh, I think you said you talked with Jim Irwin, but uh, before he died, maybe I don't think you did. But I know you said you talked to David Scott. Here's David Scott at the boulder where they found the Genesis rock, and on the other side, uh, down there is Irwin with the lunar rover that you see has uh, parked, and in the one six gravity is kind of tilted and is actually maybe sliding down the side of this mountain a little bit. So gorgeous rendition of that. Doug, and that's not good enough for Doug. He wanted to look at it from the other direction. So there it is. What a beautiful artistic touch of this, where there is Irwin on his knees, and he talked to Scott about this, and that this was really an event that happened that was not captured on film or, or the, the video. And up there, see, there. Let's let's go back. There's from the one angle. Scott looking down at Irwin, and Irwin saying, I think this thing's about to roll over me. Uh, stop. <laughs> and, uh, of course, he's strong enough to, to hold it back there. But uh, quite an interesting uh, uh, concept and design there by Doug Forrest. Beautiful, beautiful. And then another one will show is, yes, though this candle looks like a black and white photo, like many of his pieces of work does. This is um, Al... Uh, Walter, uh, uh, Al Warden on his first historic spacewalk, all right, going uh, out on an EVA uh, to retrieve the film canister in his hand from the cameras that uh, took uh, thousands of frames of, uh, on super-duper telephoto images of the moon. Now, one thing you notice is he's got the commander's helmet on, all right? And not sure what that's all about, but uh, he may have had to use the striped helmet of uh, David Scott for some reason. Uh, and uh, I'd like to know the story on that. Uh, I think I've heard it somewhere, but my memory just maintains what I need I to know. Yeah, he uh, that uh, his didn't fit or uh, maybe the communications didn't fit in or something, but that's definitely uh, Scott's... Uh, a uh, helmet with the stripes so you can tell him and Irwin apart. And uh, uh, Carlton Bailey knows that. That was a beautiful launch last night, Carlton. A nice blue flame. Hopefully you can make some money on the shot tonight. Uh, but it's only about 60% chance of that Falcon Heavy going off. And our photography friend, freelancer Carlton Bailey, doing uh, able to get out there. Linda Brandt is watching today. Uh, is that uh, uh, Kendall Lee Brandt? Marty, I wonder. Uh, Dave Stange, he's watching. Hazel Banks, you're about to get teary-eyed, as I will, talking about uh, our good friend Bob Pearson here. Robert Laws up in Scotland. Great weekend to you, my friend. Christopher Mick, hope you have some good spring weather to enjoy the weekend in Wisconsin. Steve Hammer, thank you, Steve, for watching. Space Monkey, thank you. And uh, Space Monkey, give us some money there as you're making those comments on YouTube. Uh, and uh, Bill Whiting, Bill uh, is going to watch the launch, and is he heading back this weekend, Marty? Yeah, 
Yeah, uh, Sunday. Okay, well, I got a question, Marty, or comment. Yeah, from Doug Forrest. He said they only had two helmets, so Al had to use Scott's. So Al had to use Scott's because Irwin was wearing his own while standing in the hatch. But then what was Scott wearing? I don't know. Doug, what was yeah, Scott wearing? Yeah, they all three had to have helmets on because they opened up the hatch. But uh, but a good try, Doug. <laughs> no, no, appreciate you, Doug. Uh, we we still got uh, we. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, I mean, just thank him for for being a friend. He gave us uh, uh, some of his artwork to uh, uh, give in, in a couple of raffles that we've had. Uh, Marty, you and I bought pieces of his artwork. He's just fabulous. Uh, you know, all of our artists, we love them. Uh, Tim Gagnon, uh, the Patch Guy, and of course Chris Kelly. They all have their own unique niche of what they do. And here's something that uh, I think uh, Doug was inspired. Uh, by all the shuttle exposure that he's had when he's visited the American Space Museum and was part of our shuttle fest uh, last year uh, in April. This is Endeavor with O-U-R. Uh, again, a spaceship named Endeavor like the Apollo 15 uh, command module. Uh, and Marty takes this out there. He got astronauts to frame the original print and now you have it matted to have more astronauts put on there. How many are you up to, my friend? I got 20 right now. All right. And uh, what do the astronauts say when they show this to you, when they see this? I mean, absolutely everyone made comments about it, just how unusual it was, just how beautiful it is. And I always tell them where I got it from. Yeah. I got it from Doug Forrest, who gave me the friends and family discount <laughs> that's right Which friends meant and family discounts we <laughs> like those doug you know, that just uh, meant they didn't have to pay for shipping yeah that's right <laughs> well there's patina on that it's just uh and i dabble with pens pencil now and uh just uh him and chris Kelly, uh just the patience they have to do uh this work is just hours and hours uh, involved in this and quite an interesting perspective and uh hope you're selling a lot of them out there doug is endeavor is going to be uprighted outside uh not too far from you where you live he said he lives uh, about 10 miles from jet propulsion lab uh, but uh, we've enjoyed our little tribute to you doug forrest and can't wait to see you again uh in our museum to bridge the space between us buddy and I love this photograph of Apollo 15 because uh, I think uh, whoever took it just laid the Hasselblad on just inches above the surface of the, of the moon and wish some of them had done that a little more. They're always pointing down at things. And we photographers know that sometimes you get down on your knees and you put the camera on the ground and maybe tilt it up a little bit. You, you got a whole different perspective on life. But this is a great view of the regolith, the churned up, boulders and rocks that are spewed out by the impacts of of meteorites bombarding the moon uh, tons of it every day well let's go talk a little bit about uh, our buddy bob pearson and the amazing uh flight crew training building one of the few color pictures you're going to see of this in the foreground here is the apollo uh, uh i think that's the command module in the foreground there and in the back is the lunar module a different color uh in, hidden in all of that angled stuff uh, that are really that is uh imaging uh, uh projectors and simulators that look out the that are over the windows of a command module inside of all that john young called it the great train wreck uh, when he trained in it they had two of them for the command module pilots to to really hone their skills and then the uh, lunar module pilots trained in the other one and uh, our friend bob pearson uh was uh oh, let me go wrong way peach fuzz there we go there's bob uh he passed away in 2002 uh he uh first worked in the gemini program as a uh computer technician in the uh, gemini simulators okay uh and um uh he was a truly a national treasurer. He died at age 87, so lived a great long life. And he'd say, I landed on the moon more times than anyone. And also he's proud that he'd say, I knew 
the moon astronauts as good as anybody. Uh, a native of Michigan, Bob was a Fred Astaire dance instructor in the early 1960s. And uh, he got involved uh, uh, with uh, uh, the lunar simulation. Um, I was trying to see what, what his expertise was that got him into that. But uh, the LM simulator, he said, used a relief map of the landing area and video camera projector in the windows to create the best video game of all time. That attracted dignitaries, politicians, VIPs, like actors who wanted to land on the moon, and Bob would take him there and do it with sometimes even with an astronaut there. Um, here he is with his, his, uh, his day book of uh, who came in and out or his, his his test book that is filled with every mission that they ran how many they ran it'll say things like armstrong in the building at 5 30 buzz came in at 5 35 we started on liftoffs right away uh and uh, uh very fascinating that book worth thousands and thousands of dollars um of course the mit uh, developed the DSKY numbered computer pad with codes like P59 for different things on there. And uh, Bob loved telling the stories. There he's holding the rubber hand controller that all the astronauts used. That covered the the, uh, the ascent um, joystick controls there. And there's his uh, book there. And like I said, we've got a couple programs on YouTube with him. There, uh, a couple of stories I love sharing with him uh, is that uh, he uh, was a Civil War buff, and uh, let me tell you this: uh, uh, he has an experience with Neil Armstrong. I'll show, I'll tell you that here in a second. But uh, one time he said uh, Neil and him were doing liftoffs. That Neil, you know, the first lift off the moon, uh, he wanted to make sure it was right, and that instead of pulling up on this handle that Bob's holding, like a, a pilot would think to do. The program, you had to lean forward with it to go up. And Neil kept leaning forward and uh, kept uh, going up, lifting up, and it crashed. Lifting up, and it crashed. Lifting up, and it crashed. And, and Bob said he kept doing it so many times, I, I couldn't find a way to be really polite to tell him, you're doing it wrong, you know. Uh, but uh, finally, he got it to... Uh, Neil did it right, and Neil just gave him a big smile and says, I guess I finally got that right, Bob, huh? And uh, so, uh, you know, really a very, very interesting man. He, he also remembers the time that Neil was, they were all in their headsets. He was, uh, Neil was the commander. Bob was playing the, uh, the pilot in their uh, Aldrin's role. And over the headsets, somebody said, Barbara Eden's in the building. And he's of the TV show, I Dream a Genie. And he said, Neil ripped off his headset and ran out in the middle of a lunar landing uh, session and we crashed, okay? Uh, they would have dignitaries from Germany there. So when they got down to the uh, 10 miles a, or above the surface or just a mile above, they would have a Volkswagen on the moon. Or they had an Eiffel Tower there for dignitaries from uh, France and so forth. So uh, he said it was the best game uh, video game anyone ever had. Uh, and I'll tell this story uh, to go out with beautiful Bob there. Uh, and uh, he loved his car. There he's outside of, that's outside of Hazel's driveway there. You took that picture, Hayes. During the Apollo 11 lunar descent, Pearson was in the back room in Houston at the uh, uh, Manned Operations Center, later called Johnson Spacecraft Center. He was talking to Jack Garman, uh, uh, who was the chief of all of the simulators. And they were talking about the 1201 and 1202 alarms. And then Garmin called Pearson after noticing that Buzz Aldrin was having difficulty aligning the inertial measurement unit on the limb. Pearson told Garmin that it was the way Buzz always did it in the simulator, leave him alone. So they didn't give him any call-outs or anything, and everything went fine. Uh, so George Cherry, I correct myself, not Jack Garman. George Cherry was the director of the Lunar Simulation Program. And when they had the hair-raising landing of Apollo 11, George Cherry in Houston, there at the controls, singled out Bob Pearson to shake his hand. Bob replied that he, that he Cherry, was the director uh, and deserved the praise. But Cherry said in front of all the group 
that it was Pearson who actually taught the astronauts to use the simulator and make the lunar landings, and it had worked. So uh, kudos to the late Bob Pearson. Bob has always been interested in Civil War history. Here's an interesting story about him and Neil Armstrong. Uh, he went to an auction and got letters from uh, Colonel Philip Perry Brown, the regimental commander of the New York uh, 157th Regiment. Uh, so it filled two boxes. So he brought the, le the letter boxes to the si Lunar Simulator building to sort through them during a pause in the training schedule. All right. And in walked Neil Armstrong and offered to help organize the records of this distinguished regiment who fought at Gettysburg, Chancellorsville, and Fort Pulaski, Georgia. And uh, Bob said that he and Neil spent over an hour reading these letters, laughing, sometimes, you know, kind of sad about what they said, uh, about all the interesting accounts from Colonel Brown. And for me, this story highlights the multidimensional character of Neil Armstrong and Bob Pearson as well. So we certainly miss you, Bob. Uh, he is one of the another hidden figure of the Apollo program, uh, like Marty Winkle and so many people that supported this museum. Uh, we bless you all. So thank you and God bless you. And as we go out this weekend looking at the moon, or the earth, I mean, the beautiful earth from the moon, uh, or but halfway between the earth and the moon on a telephoto lens, probably taken by Uncle Al Ward, and we can say that to remind people that uh, we are all earthlings. We are all uh, not passengers on Earth, spaceship Earth. We're crewmates, and we need to take care of this gorgeous planet that uh, obviously uh, uh, we've not found another like it uh, in the universe. So, Marty, thank you very much uh, for a good show. Hope everybody's enjoyed staying curious today with some lunacy. They get out and look at the moon a little bit. I don't care what type of telescope you have. Get it out. Find the eyepiece that has the highest number on it, like 25. That's 25 millimeter, the lowest power. And, and then uh, look at the moon in binoculars, whatever. And just uh, uh, like the family of Neil Armstrong said when he died, you know, give a little wink up there to Neil and all the other astronauts that pioneered man's greatest adventure. And we're repeating again and remembering Apollo 15 <clears throat> on this date, uh, 52 years later when it landed in 1971. So with that, I'd like to say on behalf of the Space Museum, we appreciate everybody's support. Uh, if you feel in your heart to go to YouTube and give us a few bucks, uh, once again, you go up there and uh, look for those little dots and you'll find your way around there. So until next week, when we rack it up and do it all again and get into the shuttles of the month of August and some more lunar uh, stories from Apollo 15, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us. <laughs>